Benjamin Disraeli once said, be amusing, never tell unkind stories, above all, never tell long ones. Well, you're not going to have a long one, but Disraeli knew that there is great power in the narrative, and to continue the conference theme of personal stories and to discuss how finding your passion can change your life, I'd like to introduce Barry DeVola, a journalist with Rolling Stone, Sydney Morning Herald and Who magazine, who will talk with the great broadcaster, James Valentine. Would you make them welcome, please? Okay. I was just being critical of the you know, background, the walk-on music. I wanted Wagner. <laughs> that was one of your lesser-known hits, wasn't oh, it? Yeah, yeah. That was from 1986, was yeah, it? I think so. hmm. Hello, everyone. I'm Barry Devola. That's James Valentine on my left, not a puppet from the Thunderbirds. And um, cool. Cool we <laughs> let me tell you a bit about this man before we start delving into his life. James Valentine, many of you probably know him from 702 ABC as the uh, afternoon presenter. In fact, he, I just picked James up from finishing his show this afternoon. But he's many other things apart from that. He's a columnist for The Australian. He has written six books, um, including a children's series and, and other books based on material from his radio show. He has been a musician for many, many years. He was a pop star for some years. You probably, if you're of a certain age, had a poster of him up on, the, up on your wall. He's played with everyone from, from Kate Sobrano to Wendy Matthews and, of course, was a member of the models during their most commercial era, the out-of-mind, out-of-sight era. And just recently, he has returned to his great love of jazz saxophone and he's got his own band. And they're, in fact, playing tonight. Golden Sheaf Hotel, 7 o'clock. I'll take my money now. Thank you. Very good. Double um, bay, not far. You know. <laughs> not far to go at all. Fifteen dollars in a cab. If you feel like letting your hair down later, it's a crazy night, believe oh, me. Oh yeah. Um, now we're talking about passion, and we're talking about following your passions, and obviously from that list of things I, I just told you about, he's a passionate man who has many of them and has followed many of them in his life. What I want to find out first is to go back a little in time and find out about the young James Valentine. Find out about the boy before he became the man. <laughs> so, James, I know that you grew up in Ballarat. Mm -hmm. You had glasses and you played the flute yeah. as a young man. Yeah. Were you a complete and utter nerd? Mm. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, it was a weird thing to be a you know, country town kid and uh, keen on the flute. <laughs> you know, uh, walking around, uh, walking around at high school with a little flute case and um, playing the, uh, the classical repertoire of the flute. But it sort of, I, and, and I don't even, I, even to this day, I couldn't tell you why, and even now I can't really tell you why I play. I like to play, I like the sensation of it, I like the interaction with, with musicians, and that, that happened when I was about nine or ten. I just went, oh, this is good, I like this. I showed odd aptitude for the recorder, you know, like... So you know, few do. So few they? do, you know, like in, in a class of 30 at a normal public school in, in Ballarat, they handed out the recorders and I came back sort of a week later and went, is this how this tune goes? And I was sort of playing tunes on it and the, you can see, that, you know, I can even now kind of remember the teachers going, well, we've never had one like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. And so then they, they found a flute teacher, which oddly enough there was one in Ballarat and so I just did that. I went to a high school where there was plenty of music and so I started to get involved in... I tried all the woodwinds and all that sort of stuff before um, saxophone and jazz and that sort of thing. So played. music was pretty much a very early in your life, even yeah. before you were a teenager, you yeah, started yeah. picking yeah. up and, 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 and oddly enough in sort of woodwinds and that sort of stuff. But um, by the time I was sort of, you know, probably 15 or 16, I was studying jazz quite intensely and started to think, oh, yeah, that's what I'll do when I... I'll leave school, I'll go, and, uh, I'll go and do that, so, yeah. Right, so the, the, the old question about what do you want to be when you grow up, if mm. I would have asked you at like 15, 16, you would have said... Yeah, I would, by that stage I was starting to say, I want to, I want to study the saxophone, I want to play jazz, and I, my ambition at that point would have been, I am going to join the Miles Davis band. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever the Miles Davis band was going to be by the time I got out there, I was going to be in that, uh, that band, which was an ambition shared by about 100,000 mm. saxophone players around the world, really. Didn't so quite work out for you in quite that way. Didn't quite. I saw him play once, but uh, he didn't say, hey, come <laughs> up, man, sit in. <laughs> he did once and then you woke up. That's right. It was Ooh. all a dream. <laughs> yeah. um, so, okay, you didn't 
actually go into jazz saxophone at the beginning as your career. In mm. fact, you went on a completely different route. Mm. How did that happen and, and where well, did you end up I going? I went off to Melbourne to study and I was yeah. studying jazz and I was studying classical saxophone and jazz and, and, uh, and starting to work. And uh, the, the, the issue with me, I suppose, was that I, wa I was off being a musician but I didn't really know what that was. I didn't come from a musical family at all. I had no real model as to how you were a musician. So I just knew you had to work and you had to get gigs. And I didn't really, I didn't think I was any good. I thought it was okay, mm -hmm. but I didn't, I, di I just, it didn't seem to me as though I was going to be able to get out there and carve out a, a spot as a, as a player. Um, and sometimes when you're sort of studying in those sort of things, there's also, there's a, there's a very, it can seem like this big system, a big orthodoxy. There was a lot of orthodoxy around the playing of jazz, and there still is, you know, like mm. you must do it in this way, you've got to do it in that way. And I was finding it a bit hard to fit into that, which was also then making me feel like I wasn't very good. I felt I had to work, so I took whatever work there was, and that work led me into rock bands. That's where the, that's where music was at that point. There were rock. There was, you know, every pub had a rock band. They, they toured all the time. And so by the time I was about 21, I was in a band with Joe, with Joe Camilleri's band, the band he had straight after the Falcons. And w we left on a, you know, literally we left on a Tuesday in February, and I came back a year later. <laughs> um, we just went on the road for a, a year. We played six nights a week and that sort of stuff. So that sort of seems okay as a, as a thing to do. It was great fun and I was enjoying the music to a certain extent. And then that led to other rock tours and that sort of stuff. So I sort of woke up one day and found myself a rock saxophonist on Countdown and kind of going, yeah, <laughs> all right, <laughs> okay. Which is about all you do as a rock saxophonist. You don't actually play. You just <laughs> hang around and go, come on. <clears throat> do lots of that while the rest of the band's doing things. And then in the middle you go, hey, <laughs> And that's about it. And then you go back to going. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, that was James Valentine's 80s. That's right. That's what it was like for yeah, him. Yeah. So I, I eventually found, I, I hated it. I, like after a while, I, just, I had no interest in it. So it was, I was really bored with it. I, I hated being on so tour. Let me, let me just pull you up mm. there. You can get bored being a pop star. You can I get, mean, you, you were in the models. It's it was, tedious. It was a number one album. You're mm. on Countdown. You were touring everywhere. Presumably... Mm. Everything the, was being thrown at you. The week, the week, the day we, we, we got the news, you know, somebody rang up and said, oh, you know, Adam on our site's the number one single in the country. We received that, that message in, like, the Flag <laughs> Motel in Young. That's a great motel. Oh, lovely motel where we share, there's three of us in a room, we're going to play at the Young RSL or whatever <laughs> that evening. And I think we went and played to about 40 people that night at the Young RSL. Oh, Young rocked that night. The number one band in the country. They all came out. Um, I'm sure they appreciated it. But it was an inc it's an incredibly tedious thing to do. Like, the, the basic day was roll out of bed at about sort of, you know, 9.30 or 10, eat, roll a joint, get into the car, smoke the joint, drive to the next place, you know, find the venue at about 2 in the afternoon, hang around, smoke a joint, go to sound check, smoke a joint, <laughs> come back to, you know, the place, eat, smoke a joint, play at about 11... At night, so you're in Young. You're not playing till 11 in the evening, and then there's a lot to do at Young uh, in Young as young, well. Young, you know the the cultural sort of activities. The Chinese restaurant there, lovely, mm -hmm. really lovely. Um, the beef with the black bean sauce is very superb. good. Superb. You know, you finish at midnight or something. There's nothing to do. You go back to a, a bad motel. You smoke a joint. You get up at 9:30 in the morning and repeat, repeat by 365 by five years. I was a bit bored with it. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I should have mentioned earlier, this talk will have drug references. That's right. That's I should right. have mentioned that yeah. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the only variation was like, we did, we did an American tour and that went for three or four months across America. The variation was it happened in a bus, in the Spinal Tap bus. If you've ever seen Spinal mm -hmm. Tap or any of those rock movies where there's two lounge rooms and bunks in the middle on a touring bus, we had one of those. You lived on it. You know, so the variation was you're in Houston but it's like you're, in, you're not in Houston, you're in Parramatta of Houston, <laughs> parked outside a hockey stadium. <laughs> and so you wake up at 10 o'clock and walk out of this bus and you're going, oh, I don't know where we are. Roll a joint. Um, <laughs> and that's it. You were stuck there for the day. Sound check was at five. The, 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 the rock life, there's, it's, there's nothing to do. Mm. 
because sound checks at five and the gigs at 11. I think and Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones, yeah. I think they'd been going for about 25 years and yeah. he was asked about what life was like in the Rolling Stones and he said, it's been five years of playing on stage and 20 years of waiting around and getting on buses yeah. to get to the gigs, yeah, basically. Exactly. So I, yeah. I, I sort of imploded here in, mm. in Sydney at about 25 and just went, I, I can't, you know, the, the model sort of broke up and I was offered, I could, could have gone on tour with Diesel Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for about three weeks and then just went, oh, I can do time with the bear. You um, had nothing left in the tank I, there was for nothing diesel. I had, I had to stop doing this. And I turned into a complete idiot, you know, five years of smoking dope will do that to you. Mm. Um, but I, I just... That's I didn't why have, they call it dope. I didn't have a clue, you know, like, I, exactly. I had a, my now wife was my girlfriend at that time and she would just look at me and go, you do not know how to tie your shoelaces, mm -hmm. do you? You know, you need the tour manager to tie your shoelaces. So I turned into a fool and I was sick to death of it and... It was wrong, and, and, and you know, the, the cutting to the crux of this, I was so far away from my passion mm -hmm. that I basically just, I gave up playing. I, I played a little bit with Wendy Matthews for the next couple of years, but I basically just you stopped practicing. You packed the sacks away? And, and then eventually, a few years later, I just, I, I put it away and I didn't play for 10 years, mm. 10, or, 10 or 12 years. Well, let's talk then about what passions you did find mm. after mm. you came off the road mm. from being a pop star. Well, what it, happened? I mean, you obviously went into the media, yeah. first with television. Well, it was sort of simultaneous. I was lucky enough to get a, I got an audition for, um, for a kid's show and I got the job. So I got to host a kid's show on the ABC during, during the 80s on ABC television called The Afternoon Show. And that was fantastic. It was great training. It was good fun. It was that, that, that I quite enjoyed. But I was also writing. I was starting to write for magazines and I'd write CD reviews and music features and that sort of stuff for, for Rolling Stone and I got, a, I got a job reviewing for The Australian and that sort of thing. So I had those sort of things were going on, so that was quite good. Um, so that was all right and then I realised I didn't want to be, I probably didn't want to be, a, I didn't have a passion for children's television and so I noticed that anybody in children's television tended to have a passion for that particular thing. You weren't a wiggle. I, was, I wasn't going to be a wiggle, um, you know, they just started, how we laughed at them. <laughs> <laughs> Really? <laughs> oh, you're going to play for children, are you? <laughs> That'll never Idiots, work. <laughs> fools, you look ridiculous in those skivvies. <laughs> you are better off as the cockroaches. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the Wiggles do five entertainment centres in a day and they're only on there for 45 minutes at a time. It's very nice and it's 13,000 times 25. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, yeah, so, so that was sort of all going on and so I, I didn't want to do that. So I moved, so I decided to look for other things and I fell in a huge hole because I, I, I started working in crap television. Um, we've all got shows that we love. There's 23 other hours of television that someone's <laughs> got to make. And I'd, I had a terrific career for about five or six years making that. So I'd, I'd be on Good Morning Australia as the entertainment reporter or the midday show. or it, 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 I reached my, my nadir at, at, when I was doing a thing called Afternoons what a great title for a show. Um, was it on in the morning? No, oddly oh, enough, right. it was on at about two o'clock <laughs> afternoons with Kerry Ann Kennelly. And it was, uh, went on between two and three in the afternoon. And my job was I wrote Kerry Ann's scripts. I appeared on a panel, a Beauty and the Beast panel. Um, and this all took place in about two days. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they recorded, it was a horrendous second day, like on the Wednesday, we'd record three, go live with one, and then record the last one. Right. So. Quality, not an issue. Mm -hmm. Quantity, pump it out. Plenty you know. of it. And by, I just reached a point where this was awful. At the same time, though, I discovered the thing I really, that, that just, it, I loved it so much, I just wanted, I was going to kill people to get there. Um, radio. Mm -hmm. I started filling in on, on 702 ABC Sydney. I rang them up. I'm, I do a lot of crap television. Could I fill in on radio? And they went, sure, come and. Could come you? And, yes. Could you? You're exactly <laughs> who we're looking for. Um, and, you know, really a week later I got offered the after, to fill in on Afternoons, which was being done by John Doyle, Roy Slavin, at uh, HG and Roy, and I went, yeah, I, and he'd been the one I'd been listening to and I perfected quite a good impression of John by this point. So, Can we hear that? So, so I, went on, I went on the show and basically I did John for two, for two hours. <laughs> so I said, going, yes, well, that's your view of things, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Could it be that others might think differently? Hmm? So he, John, John's got—I can't quite remember it now—but John's got a very slow sort of manner. He had this sort of—he'd uh, he, tease an interview out for about half an hour, and it was it was great. But I just—I—I I, I can still—you know—I sat in the chair and I just went, oh, this, "This is, is it. How good is this? Mm -hmm. This is fantastic!" And within a very short period of time, 
I also realised automatically what I loved about it was this fantastic connection with audience. That that audience that were there wanted to be there and wanted to wanted you to be good. You mm-hmm. know, newspapers and television people sort of have it on and they flick through it and they're not. It, there's not a, the same engagement. But an audience that's there for talk radio, particularly in a, an afternoon shift like that, wants needs you. Mm-hmm. They, they, I, I need somebody talking. I need company. I'm alone. I'm at work. I'm stuck in a car. You know, this is great for me. Can you can you make it really good and and informative and stimulate me? And I just went, yes, let me be the one. So you you're know. home basically, and you're still there to yeah, this yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, it took me three years. I, I no, it took, yeah, it took me it took me five years to get back to seven two. I filled in for three years. I, I, you know, bashed on the door. I kept saying, what, you know, why? Aren't, give me a job. Give me a job. It's a, it's a funny sort of area where they need to know that you've got longevity mm-hmm. and that anyone can do it for a month or two. Can you do it for years on end? Um, I eventually got offered a job in Canberra and did two years full-time down there, at the end of which uh, I got... They rang me up and said, OK, well, there seems to be something back here at 702. Do you want to come back? I mean, I'm, you know, I only want to live in Sydney. If there's anyone from Canberra, you know, gee, you're so lucky with all that open space. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh air, it's great, isn't it? And the, the bush is so handy, yes. Oh, look, they're uh, leaving. Yes, there's that's a Canberra right. person. That there's one, another one over there. That wonderful road system where there's so few Come back, it. Mrs. Miss anyway, oh. uh, I was, that's, you know, I have nothing against Canberra. I just don't want to be there. Um, and so I, you know, to, to get off and back here, I was like, oh, yes, yes, yes. And I ran up the... You know, I didn't sleep for two days. And I ran up to the interview. And the, the interview was at, at Ravisi's in Bondi. So mm-hmm. I sat facing sort of out to Bondi. <laughs> and the program director sat down and went, so, James... Let's talk about this show. You know, if, if we gave it to you, what sort of things you know, we want to do? And I went, oh, I don't know. Just give me the job. I just want to come back. <laughs> and I just, I just, blabbed. I, I literally broke down and cried. Just, but don't ask me what ideas. I have fucking hundred ideas. I don't know. Just let me do it. <laughs> and she went, mm, this is a bit awkward. But then gave me the job, you know. <laughs> I remember that from my next interview. Remember just break that. down and cry. Break Apparently they cry. give you anything. Break down and cry and beg and it works better. Um, now, of course, you brought the sax back out from under the bed yeah. recently. Mm. And how did you decide to get back that into was, it again? That was a funny one. That, that crept back up on me. And again, look, I've, I've got, uh, I can thank crap television for a lot, really. Um, I, I, I hate telly, but I get offered a job every now and again. And they, they just, there's always big money attached to it. And you go, oh, great. Oh, poor guy. Sorry about mortgage. that. I know, it's awful, isn't it? It's terrible. <laughs> but, you know, I, so I did this horrible show called It Takes Two. Mm-hmm. And It Takes Two was a Anyone horrible... Anyone remember that? celebrity sing-off thing where there'd be a professional singer and a football player and the singer was meant to teach the football player to sing and then we would judge them. I was a judge on the show. And I, it, it, it was oh, detestable. I just couldn't stand it. But the funny thing was, one of the things that came out of it was that after, by, about, by the second series, I'm going, I just want to play. Well, there's a band over there. I want to play with a band. And all oh, you, you people are murdering these songs. Get, get out of the way. And it's just sort of... So I sort of took it out of its case and just kind of went... <laughs> you know, and then just started... What song to, is that? It's not, it's not much of a song, <laughs> but then just started to practice a little bit. And instruments like the saxophone, they're, they're uh, you know, any brass woodwind instrument, that sort of stuff, it's, there's just six months of physical work you've got to do before you'll even sound vaguely decent, you mm-hmm. know? And so I just sounded like crap. And so I just... But I kept on persisting. And I remember after a while I had to sort of turn to my wife and go, um, you know how I go early in the morning... I'm practicing. And she went, are oh, you not? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to do it seriously, but I just sort of want to maybe just play, oh, please don't be a saxophone player again. <laughs> <laughs> She's very supportive I in lots tell. of ways. You know? <laughs> and I understood what she meant. I said, no, I'm going to be a saxophone player again. I'm not, you know, I just want to see, you know, maybe just play a bit. And it's just silly I don't play. And I just like to play. And, and, and <laughs> it's just sort of, it's been great. It's the first... It's the first time since I was about 14 or 15 that I've just approached it as, what do I want to play? Mm-hmm. What do I love? What am I thinking about? And I don't care about whether... It doesn't have to have translate into anything else. I don't have to get a gig with someone. I don't mm-hmm. have to impress anybody. I don't have to... You know, I'm fortunate I don't have to make... You know, it has to pay for itself sort of thing. Like, I have to play in a, in a way that it's real... Like, it's got to be an actual gig and with actual other musicians and that sort of stuff. But I personally don't have to pay a mortgage out of it. So I'm Mm -hmm. very fortunate in that sort of way. But the weird thing, of course, is that because it is exactly what I want to do, it's working perfectly well. Mm -hmm. Gigs come in, people like it, people respond to it well, people get it. And so, 
you know, it's fantastic. I, I'm, I, I love playing now more than I did as a, when I was in pop bands and stuff like that. You know. Now, you reached a landmark this year. Yes. You, can you tell us what that landmark was? I guess you mean I'm 50. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. Uh, you can yeah. hear the shock in the audience. They, they can't shocked. believe. Wrong response, people. <laughs> you know, when anyone says they're 50, they go, oh, you're looking good. <laughs> oh, really? I never would have guessed. <laughs> so, I mean, it's traditionally a time that we look back and take stock mm. of, of what's happened. Mm. Looking back, how, what do you think so far of the life of James Valentine in the first the, half century? Look, on, on the theme of the thing, the, the, the only time I've tended to get it right is when I've been doing exactly what I want mm-hmm. to do. The, 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 more, the more I did that, whenever I did that, it was good. It was fine. As soon as I didn't do it, I was lost... I didn't know what I was doing. People didn't respond well. Nothing much happened. You know, it mm-hmm. was, I would dit around. I would get unhappy. Um, you know, and, and it's as long as I'm not. It, it, if I'm not thinking about success in terms of like, are you famous? Are you rich? All that sort of stuff. Then the real success has been things like some of the writing I've done. The radio is 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 a beautiful thing still, and I still love it. And so that's still there every day. And just playing again, like they're they're the real sort of successes, and they're all the sort of things I'm. I'm really passionate about, uh, that I really care about, and that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense to you, then you can't do it. You're not very good at it. Mm-hmm. I'm not very good at crap TV. You know, like <laughs> so any TV producers in the audience, don't bother coming but, up and offering him but, lots of money. He's not weird, interested. But that's the weird thing. Pe- there are people out. Like, I was on Sunrise for a few years. Adam Bowen, who runs Sunrise, loves Sunrise. He loves it. He thinks it's fantastic. <laughs> you know, it, he's so into it. He's into it 18 hours a day. You know, he gets it. It's that's, his thing. It's a long sunrise. I would look at it and go, oh, I can't believe I'm on this. This is <laughs> horrible. You know? James, can you read that over? Oh, session over, yes. Oh, sorry, okay. it's session over. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, that seemed to go for 10 minutes. You don't. I had such Not a for good them. time. <laughs> Please thank Mr. James Valentine, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mrs. Zavola.